where Lean still has an all-white crew. After the strikes are over, the Lurleen is back at sea. At 4 p.m. on July 5th, the next year, the crew stop their work and gather on the deck to observe the anniversary of Bloody Thursday. During the ceremony, a member of the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union addresses the entire crew. Frank McCormick, who was active on the strike committee, speaks. He's a communist, and it's no secret that he is a gay man. These men were shot down by police, McCormick says, while fleeing from a reign of terror let loose by certain economic forces. As workers, they made the supreme sacrifice in our behalf. Sperry and Bordeaux, we shall not forget you, or the blood and red roses on the pavement, or the magnificent ideal of justice and militancy for which you died. Mickey Blair first met Frank McCormick while wandering the San Francisco waterfront after the strikes. Mickey's a teenager who's been kicked out of the army and his home when it's discovered that he's gay. On the San Francisco Pierce, he notices this handsome man, 20 years his senior, giving a speech to the crowd, and he finds this man very attractive. Mainly it was his lovely speaking voice, Mickey says. He liked the way Frank was so sure of himself as a union militant and as a gay man. They start a courtship that lasts many years. When Mickey eventually joins the union, the two men start to live together as a couple. On the day they first meet, Frank McCormick is already a member of the Communist Party. The party's policy is that homosexuals cannot be members because homosexuality is a form of bourgeois decadence. <laughs> <laughs> but Frank McCormick was drawn to the party's vision of a better world for working people of many races. Rebels Caton joined the Communist Party because he wanted to contribute to uh, combining what he called Negro rights with working class politics. In the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union, he has a chance to do this. After the strikes, the stewards vote for, quote, equal shipping to all members, quote, and against keeping black stewards segregated on the Alexander ships. So now, the time has come to begin integrating the white ships. Revels Caton has become the spokesman for the black stewards. His strongest ally is his friend, Tom Baker, a militant unionist who doesn't care who knows that he is gay. This gay white man and straight black man work as a team their strategy is to link racial integration with better wages and conditions so that the white men can experience integration as a real benefit to them. But the deckhands and firemen sometimes threaten any black steward who dares to integrate a white ship. When the union in Seattle dispatches two black messmen onto a dollar line, both are attacked and severely injured by white deckhands before the vessel gets to Yokohama. To prevent this kind of violence, they find big, strong longshoremen and stewards to escort the black stewards up the gangway and protect them from being thrown overboard once the ship goes out to sea. The union brings charges against anyone who threatens their members, and they tie up ships if a white crew refuses to sail with a black steward on board. By the late 30s, the Madison ships are finally becoming integrated. When the Alexander ships go out of business, black stewards are reassigned to the white miners as jobs become available, and several are elected delegates by a majority of white men, many of them gay. After winning their strikes, the cooks and stewards begin to make their union more democratic. On each ship, they elect a delegate to represent them. Right away, the stewards start to elect gay men, like Mickey Blair. One day, a crew member from another department comes to Blair and says, you're going to have to get rid of Frank Bowers because he's too flamboyant. Blair calls the accuser into a stewards meeting and asks him, can you prove this man wasn't doing his job? Did he break any rules of the contract? No. Well, then you just get your ass out of here, Blair tells him. <laughs> <laughs> the Marine Cooks and Steward Union is going way out on a limb. It's full of communists, its queens are getting bolder, and it's recruiting men of color. Other seamen begin to attack the Union by baiting its most vulnerable and controversial members, pointing fingers, and calling them names. The newspaper of the Sailors' Union of the Pacific, which is anti-black, anti-communist, and anti-gay, calls them the Marine Cooks and Fruits. Sailors and firemen hurl racial insults at the stewards of color and even the white stewards, and they attack MCS leaders as Reds. Some hostile seamen put these insults all together and call the MCS 
a third red, a third black, and a third queer. Revels Caden, Tom Baker, and Frank McCormick meet with other left-wing activists to develop a more organized strategy for the union to respond. They could have denied that there were any homosexuals or communists in their midst, or condemned them to win respectability. But instead, they expose how the baiting itself divides union men from one another and plays into the ship owner's hands. The union's enemies are already connecting red, black, and queer. So they come up with a slogan that captures what they're searching for. It's anti-union to red bait, race bait, or queen bait. And if you let them red bait, they'll race bait. If you let them race bait, they'll queen bait. These are all connected. That's why we have to stick together. Mounted over their union hall's job board is this CIO motto. <clears throat> Equality in hiring regardless of race, religion, nationality, or political opinion. With this spirit in place, the members of the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union prepare themselves to go to war. During World War II, the passenger liners are converted to carry troops, and the building of new ships opens jobs for cooks and stewards. The membership of the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union skyrockets from 4,500 to over 15,000 as men flock into the Union for wartime jobs. Some are gay men who want to serve their country but don't want to join the military because of its anti-gay policies. Or they are gay men the Navy has already discharged as homosexuals. Some new members are black and Filipino men who want to serve at sea but won't tolerate the Navy's racist Jim Crow policies. By the end of 1945, African-American men make up more than half of the union's membership. Other new members are white men who've never before had to treat men of color as equals. When some of them provoke racist incidents on ships, union officials launch a campaign to teach these men racial tolerance. And at its wartime convention, the Marine Cooks and Stewards Union protests after the government removes Japanese American stewards from ships as national security risks. The union at last officially takes the anti-Asian language out of its own constitution. The members also expand economic democracy within their unions. From 1945 to 1949, the MCS triples investments wages. When unemployment hits the union hard, the rank and file votes to start a swing system for sharing jobs. Union officials draw no pay during strikes, and they must work on the ships for at least one trip every year. The Marine Cooks and Stewards is earning a reputation as one of the most democratic, racially integrated, and pro-gay unions in the United States. But the Korean War is now heating up, and the MCS opposes using U.S. merchant vessels to send troops and supplies to Korea. In the anti-communist and anti-gay hysteria of the early 1950s, the Marine Cooks and Stewards becomes an easy target. The government